And under the angel of the church in Thyatira. Thyatira means continual sacrifice. Continual sacrifice. Already we have a key to understand what this church means. Okay? By its name. Continual sacrifice. Okay? So he says, to write this church, Thyatira. These things saith the Son of God. Very unusual. The focus is on the deity of Jesus. That he is God. The Son of God. So that's another key to understanding what's going on in this church. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith. And thy patience and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So again, there's keys there about this church's problem. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he. Say all the churches. Shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, in which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. End of what? Well, there's the end of the age, ultimately. We'll get to that in a minute. To him will I give power over the Gentiles, the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. Now will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Genesis 1. God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule, say rule, to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, say rule. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule, say rule, over the day, over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Okay, do you see that? All right. Fourth day is when we see the lights appear. We see two great lights are given by God to rule. One to rule by day, one to rule by night. The focus is rulers. Deuteronomy 16. 16 says this. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread. That's connected with Passover. And in the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So the first feast is what? Unleavened bread or connected to Passover. There are seven total feasts. Leviticus 23 will tell you that. Now, go please to 1 Kings 16. Old Testament history is laid out in these seven churches. There are seven er, uh, historical periods in the Old Testament. And we are now in the kingdom or king's time. 
in this church of Thyatira. It puts us in the time of the kings. Okay, 1 Kings 16, 31. It came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel. The daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Okay, so the king of Israel took a woman by the name of Jezebel, who is a worshiper of Baal. She's a Zidonian princess. The Bible says, and went and served who? Baal and worshipped him. What is happening here is we have a mixture. Now, the king of Israel is now going to mix the worship of God with the worship of Baal. Okay? Verse 32, he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. So he literally built a house for that false god. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Got it? Okay, so Jezebel, King Ahab, married her. She is a priestess of Baal. And he began to worship Baal and mix the worship of God with the worship of Baal. Now go to Genesis 10. Okay, verse 8. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, or literally against the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, Nimrod, when, I, when we read about Baal worship, we're talking about Nimrod worship. Because Baal is just another name for Nimrod. Okay, so we have this man in the earth named Nimrod. He is against the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was in where? Babel, which was in where? Babylon. And Erech and Akkad and Calneth in the land of Shinar, that's Babylon. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, the habitation of the sun. Nineveh means habitation of the sun. And the city... Rehoboth and Kala. Okay, so now you're familiar with Nimrod, right? He is mighty in the earth. He's a, he's a powerful ruler. He's against God. His kingdom is located in Babylon. Okay, Genesis 11. The whole, whole earth was of one language and one speech. Now remember, um, this is after the flood. About two, three hundred years after the flood. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. They dwelt there. They said one to another, go to, let us make brick, burn them, with, burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, let us be scattered upon, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So these men, under the leadership of Nimrod, are building a tower. And this tower is so that they can reach to the heavens, okay? The Bible says, now watch this. The Lord, get, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men building. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from him which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down therefore and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad from the face of all the earth. So what we have here, what is happening very early. About two to three hundred years after the flood. Is a man who is trying to establish a one world government. Establish a one world religious system. And a one world economy. So it's a picture of the last days. Where we have the Antichrist. One world government, a one world economy, and a one world religious system called Mystery Babylon. She's riding on the back of that beast. And so this is the roots of all that's going to take place in the future. Genesis and Revelation go together. Genesis is the seed. Revelation is the fulfillment of it. Okay? All right. So now do you understand who or what Babel is, what the Tower of Babel is? That was the center of their worship. 
there was a man by the name of Nimrod. He is the first type of Antichrist. He's the world government, world leader. He had a wife named Samaramus, who had a son named Tammuz. Samaramus claimed that Tammuz was the reincarnated Nimrod who had died, who had been slain by a wild boar. Okay? So Nimrod had a wife named Samaramus who had a son named Tammuz. Nimrod is killed. Tammuz is born. And to cover up her whoredoms, okay, she had this child by heart a tree. To cover it up, she said that it was Nimrod the father come back in the sun, reincarnated in the sun, and his name was Tammuz. Do you understand that? Very important. Okay, so Jezebel, when she comes in history, is a woman who is a priestess of Nimrod. She's a priestess of Nimrod, Samaramus, and Tammuz, the satanic trinity. Okay? She's involved in that worship. And then Ahab gets involved in it. He marries her and mixes the worship of God with the false worship of Baal, which started in the days of Nimrod, back at the Tower of Babel. Does that make sense to you? Okay. It's still with us today. 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven is none other than Nimrod's wife. When you talk about the queen of heaven, you are talking about Nimrod's wife or Samaramus. So they are burning incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. So they have a a mass that is associated with her worship. They burn incense unto the queen of heaven. They pour out drink offerings unto her. It's a non-bloody sacrifice as we have done. And we and our fathers, our kings, our princes in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. They said as long as we were offering incense to the queen of heaven and offering these drink offerings to her, we were blessed. But since we left off, so you can see the mixture of Baal worship in God's people or in God's congregation. And they're very confused because they say that this is a blessing to them. Verse 18, but since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her? Cakes to worship her. Say with me, cakes to worship her. Okay, so we've got a, we've got an offering here. We've got a non-bloody offering here. We have a bread offering, a meal offering, catch it, a meal offering and a drink offering. You get it? Hold on to that, please. You need all this. Uh, they pour out drink offerings unto her without our men. Then Jeremiah said unto them, all the people to the men and to the women and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, the incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, your princes, and people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not in his, into his mind so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings. And because of the abominations which you have committed. So he called the offering of these drink offerings and this, these cake offerings to the queen of heaven. as an abom They were an abomination to God. Okay. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant at this day. So they were worshiping the queen of heaven. Offering her a non-bloody sacrifice or a mass. Go to Ezekiel chapter 8. Prophet Ezekiel. Jeremiah is a pre-exile prophet. Ex Ezekiel is an exile prophet. He's a prophet that went into captivity with them. Ezekiel chapter 8. Now I'm going to read to you about, I read to you about the woman, the queen of heaven. Now I'm going to read to you about the son of this woman and also the father or Nimrod. 
the husband of the woman and the so-called father of Tammuz or the son reincarnated. Ezekiel chapter 8. All right. So these are the problems they were having in the days of the prophets. Ezekiel 8. Let's start there in verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the, the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what thou, they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. This is why he left them. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt seek greater abominations. All right, amen. He brought me to the door of the court. When I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, the door. He said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast. This is Ezekiel 8.10. Please follow along. And all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Ezekiel 8 verse 11. And there stood before the seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah the son of Shephan with every man his censer in his hand. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Then he brought me to the door, the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. Behold, there were there set women weeping for Tammuz. That's called the season of Lent. The season of Lent is when they weep for Tammuz, the slain of Tammuz, for 40 days prior to his so-called resurrection from the dead. On Ishtar Sunday, they claim that Tammuz rose from the dead on Ishtar Sunday, Ishtar Sunday. And uh, the, the time before that is called Lent. That's where they put the ashes. That's Ash Wednesday. And that's connected with Tammuz. The worship of Tammuz. The weeping of Ta for Tammuz. And so that's what they were doing way back in the days of Ezekiel. They still do it today. But they call it Jesus. So we have the mixture of the worship of God with the mixture of the worship uh, 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 with the church today. Just like as these days. So we've got the women weeping for Tammuz. And then he said in verse 16, uh, let me make sure, uh, verse 15. Then said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch of the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. They turned their back on God. And their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. To worship the sun. Sun worship is Nimrod worship. It is Baal worship. So now they're worshiping the father. Nimrod. Okay, you got it? They're worshiping the sun toward the east. Then he said, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit them? Now, catch this. We've, we've already seen... The offering of a meal offering to the queen of heaven with a drink offering. Listen to these very key things. Now we see these men worshiping the heavenly bodies. The sun. We see women weeping for Tammuz. And we see in Jeremiah them offering these offerings to the queen of heaven. Okay. So Nimrod, his wife, and her son. And the son's supposed to be reincarnated Nimrod. Are y'all with me up to this point? So now they are worshiping these false deities who are called Baal, who are called, it's, it's sun worship, it's Baal worship. He's known as the God of a thousand names. So any false doctrine, any false religion that's in the world today is rooted in way back in Genesis 10 and 11. Okay? 
what we need to see though is that that bell worship came into the church it no longer stayed on the outside it came right into Israel it came right into the house of God and that's what God is showing Ezekiel the prophet and Jeremiah okay and guess what as you know it came into the church of our day so are you clear so far up to this point about what I'm talking about now? Now in history, when you talk about how this system got into the church, very key in, in, uh, people, Simon Magus, A.D. 45, went to Rome. He was a bell priest. And the Roman church embraced his teaching. Okay? And I say the Roman church later in history when it became the Roman church embraced Simon Magus or Simon Pator's teaching not the Apostle Peter but Simon Magus of Acts chapter 8 another key figure in history Constantine Constantine 325 AD Constantine was the Emperor of Rome who made Christianity the state religion of Rome he was also a worshiper of Baal are you here a worshiper of the sun, a worshiper of Nimrod. He made, come on, Christianity the state religion, but he brought in his pagan belief and mixed it. The 325 AD. Also, including that, that satanic trinity. That, the false trinity. Okay, you here with me? So that when you look at the father, Baal, you look at the son, Tammuz, and you look at the woman, Samaramus, you have the father. It's a counterfeit to God. You have the son Tammuz as a counterfeit to the true Messiah, Jesus. And you have Samaramus, the mother, is a counterfeit to the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. So it's a false trinity. Okay? Are you with me up to this point? And Constantine was a worshiper of Baal, so he brought in the doctrine of the Trinity. They started baptizing the titles, Father, Son, Holy Ghost at that time, 325 A.D. But it wasn't the... The first time we see these false doctrines. These things go all the way back to Genesis. Now. When Jesus talks to the church of Thyatira. Then a continual sacrifice. This is exactly what this false system does. It offers a continual sacrifice. And I'll explain that to you as we go through these things. Okay. When I say Baal worship. You understand that we're talking about mystery Babylon in the New Testament. Revelation 17, the Bible says there's a woman riding on the back of a scarlet colored beast. Her name is called Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. So to understand who she is then, I've got to go all the way back to Genesis 10 and 11, which I have just done. And I've got to give you a little history here about the false worship that came into God's people. Okay? And what they were doing and how they did it. Because it is the Mystery Babylon, the New Testament. Now, when Jesus began to speak to these churches, these seven churches, he talked to them about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans means to conquer the people. That's another name for Nimrod. Balaam means to conquer the people. Another name for Nimrod. So what the Lord does is, and you need to see this, as you go through Revelation and you look at these churches, he talks about the same false religion over and over and over. He calls it in one place Nicolaitans. He calls it in another place Balaam. Another place he calls it Jezebel. But it's all talking about the same false religious system. With different names and you know because when you talk about this religious system you're talking about we could we could talk about everything. Hinduism, Buddhism. And I've been to Taiwan. I've seen that big those big Buddha statues. Those big Buddhas are not, that's Nimrod. They worship Nimrod. So all false religious systems come from Nimrod. He just got a bunch of names. And so does uh, the son, Tammuz, have a bunch of names. He's known as Cupid. And the woman is known by a bunch of different names. Semiramis and Isis, etc., etc. Depends on what part of the world you're in as to what they call them. But it is a counterfeit system. It is the devil trying to set up a counterfeit kingdom to the kingdom of God. It's the devil trying to set up a counterfeit Christianity. 
in place of true Christianity. Praise God. So when we look at the church of Thyatira, and we talk about a continual sacrifice, we're talking about a system of religion that has mixed the true worship of God with the, tr with the worship of Baal. Okay? Now, I've already given you a lot of uh, history about Simon Magus. Now I'm going to go over here into Thyatira, and I'm going to talk to you about a church system that's in the world today. And I'm going to show you that they are the fulfillment of Babylon. Okay? So what I'm going to do here to save time, instead of just trying to remember a lot of things, I'm going to go through some very key points to you so you'll understand that there is a church system in the world today that has the characteristics of Baal in it. They have a continual sacrifice. Number one, Peter, they claim that Peter has been given the keys, and I'm not talking about the Apostle Peter, that Rome, the Roman church recognizes a Peter that has keys. But the keys that this Peter has is not the keys that Jesus gave to Simon Peter. And the keys of Peter are not even the keys of the apostle Peter. They are the keys of one Simon Pator, Simon Magus, a false priest that the apostles had to deal with in their day. When you say that, you know, the, you talk about the keys, the Pope has keys or whatever, and, and the Roman church has the keys from Peter. These are the keys of Janus and Sybil. When you say Janus, that's just another name for Nimrod. When you say Sybil, that's just another name for his wife. Okay, are you with me at this point? The keys, when a person has those keys, they are the successor to Janus and Sybil successors, pagan gods and goddesses. And the cardinals have, or the, the word cardinal, cardo, means a hinge. The Pope is supposed to be the door to heaven. The cardinals are the Pope's helpers. They are the hinge upon which the door swings. Okay? So the church Roman claims to have the keys of heaven. The Pope claims to have the keys of heaven. He claims to be the door to heaven. And the cardinals are the hinges upon which the door swings. Okay, you with me at this point? And so when it talks about, they, when they believe they have the keys, they are the successors of bell worship. Do you understand? They are the successors of Nimrod and his wife. They are a Babylonian priesthood. Okay. Now, I'm going to prove it to you. This book, get your head up and look up at me. Don't put your head down on the floor. Get your head up and look up at me. You need to look at this. Listen to this. This is powerful. It's very, you need this. This, Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. I'm going to read something to you, okay? He exposes the papal worship and he proves it to be the worship of Nimrod and his wife. Okay? If you can't afford this book, go on the internet, type up philologos.com. It'll bring you up to a, a site where you can read the whole book for free. Get informed. The keys that the Pope bore were the keys of a Peter, well known to the pagans initiated in the Chaldean mysteries. That Peter, the apostle was ever bishop of Rome, has been proved again and again to be an errant fable. The apostle Peter was never the bishop to Rome. It's a fable. But they claim to have the keys of Peter. Okay, so whose keys do they have? Well. He goes on, he talks about uh, the occasion of his visiting, finding Simon Magus there in Rome. They claim that Peter went over to Rome and that they found Simon Magus there and that Peter the Apostle defeated that man, okay? Which is, it's, it's false, okay? Peter never went to Rome. He was never the bishop of Rome. He never gave the keys to the church in Rome, all right? But there was a Simon that was in Rome, and a Pitor, that had the keys. Watch this. 
it can be shown to be by no means doubtful that before the Christian era and downwards there was a Peter at Rome who occupied the highest place in pagan priesthood there was a Peter in Rome who occupied the highest place in the pagan priesthood the priest who explained the mysteries to the initiated was sometimes called a Greek term the Areophant but in primitive Chaldea, the real language of the mysteries, his title, as pronounced without the points, was Peter. Did you get it? He's the one, that these Peters are the one who explained these Babylonian mysteries. Which means the interpreter. Peter means the interpreter. As the revealer of that which was hidden, nothing was more natural than that while opening up the esoteric doctrine of the mysteries, he should be decorated with the keys of the two divinities whose mysteries he unfolded. Thus we may see how the keys of Janus and Sybil would come to be known as the keys of Peter, the interpreter of the mysteries. So the keys that the Pope has is the keys he claims from Peter, but Peter was an interpreter of these mysteries, Simon Magus. And the keys that he has are the keys of the two false divinities, Nimrod and his wife. He is a Babylonian priest. The Pope is a Babylonian priest. Okay, you hear? Yea, we have the strongest evidence that in countries far removed from one another and far distant from Rome, these keys were known by the initiated pagans, not merely as the keys of Peter, but as as the keys of Peter identified with Rome. So I'm trying to show you that there's the true keys of the kingdom of God and there's the false keys. See, we have a counterfeit here, a counterfeit Christendom, a counterfeit setting up of a, another kingdom, a counterfeit kingdom of God that runs side by side in the earth with God's truth. Okay? So when we talk about the keys of Peter, then we're talking about the keys of the one who interprets the mystery of Babylonianism. And that's the keys that the Pope has. And they are the keys to two false divinities. Nimrod and Semiramis, his wife. Or in that day called Janus and Sybil. Okay. And they claim that the only way to get to heaven is through their system of religion. That's why so many people are afraid to get out of Catholicism. Because for them to get out of Catholicism, they feel they're going straight to hell. Well, to be a part of Catholicism means you're a part of a false religious system and I'm gonna look in the cameras and you better get out of it you can't stay in it so that's the keys but they're the keys of pagan deities that the Pope has now let me talk to you about the rosary the rosary in the uh, let me give the Chaldee language the rosary literally means let me get this it means ro, thought, and share, director, share, thought, director. So the rosary is a thought director. Okay, have y'all ever heard of the rosary of the sacred heart? We're going to talk to you in a minute about that. But the rosary originally was used by Brahmins of Hinduism and Buddhist faith. Buddha's faith. Nimrod. Buddha is another name for Nimrod. Uh, the Lamas use the rosary. You will see it sometimes. If you, if you see something on television, you'll see these Lama, uh, these Tibetan monks, etc. And they're counting their beads. That's a rosary. That's a thought director. Okay? And so, there's a system, a religion system in the world today that has a rosary. And so it's connected to Buddha, it's connected to Babylonianism, it's connected to Nimrod. It's a thought director. All right, so I got it so far. Now, uh, the Rosary of the Sacred Heart. How many of y'all ever seen the, the Rosary of the Sacred Heart or seen the Sacred Heart? Some of you are familiar with that. You go knock on some people's door and they got a big old picture, you know, of so-called Mary. And she's got this, this rosary bead with a sacred heart on it. And, and in the... And in that heart, there's a picture of Jesus, and he's flaming, you know. Well, that's not Jesus. Okay. When you talk about the sacred heart, the heart is the child of the mother. The heart is 
Tammuz. Okay, you with me here? The heart is Tammuz, the child of the mother or the queen of heaven. As you know, Samaramus claimed that the child that she had, Tammuz, was Nimrod reincarnated. And so if he's Nimrod reincarnated, Nimrod claims to be the son, S-U-N. So the heart is the child of the mother, and we see the heart on fire because this is supposed to depict the reincarnated son, Tammuz, who is the, the father or the son, okay? The reincarnated father or reincarnated S-U-N. That's why it's on fire like that. Are you with me up to this point? The son is supposed to be the born again father. The rosary and this sacred heart are devoted to son worship. It's devoted to son worship. Falsely called Jesus. Falsely called Jesus. It is Hinduism. It's Buddhism. Paganism. Okay? So if you see somebody, somebody that's got a rosary, whatever, they're following Nimrod. They're getting their thoughts directed from a pagan deity. Okay? Now I know I'm taking my time and I intend to because you've got, I need to get this to you. The candles they light in their service are in honor of and worship to the sun god who they claim to be the light of the world. So they light all these candles. Y'all ever been in a service? They got candles everywhere, man. You know, either they're the, the dead saints representing the dead saints up there, but ultimately they honor the sun, S-U-N. The cross Okay, where are these crosses? Now we know Jesus died on the cross, but the cross is a pagan symbol. It's the first letter of Tammuz. We don't wear crosses around our necks. Jesus was crucified on the cross, and we thank God for the finished work of the cross, but that symbol goes way back before Jesus ever came into this world. It was the first letter of the letter Tammuz. Cross in pagan religion worship was a charm against the powers of darkness before Jesus ever died. That's the way they used it. It's the initial of the first letter of Tammuz. It was used to identify them with the sun, S-U-N. You with me? So they were seen when they had these symbols as worshipers of the sun. And they believed that it kept away the power of darkness. Hmm. You, you, you wonder why the spirits hate your pastor? <laughs> Man, they don't like, see, they don't like this being uncovered. But we're going to do it anyway, you know. But I'm, and I'm sure that many of you have gone to churches, not just Catholicism, but many, many liturgical, liturgical churches. You go in there and they've got crosses up front and there's a circle around the top of it. And you look at that and you say, man, that's a strange looking cross. What kind of cross is that? Circle on the top. The reason why they put a circle on the top to show you that they're connected with the sun. That their system is sun worship. They worship Tammuz. Who is a reincarnated, reincarnated Nimrod. And that's why they have that circle around the cross. So when I walk, and then not only that, but upon those crosses, you'll see IHS. On those crosses. Isis, Horus, and Seb. Isis. The false goddess, Semiramis, Horus, the sun, and Seb, Nimrod. They'll have it right there on their cross. Okay? 
and to the pagans the symbol of the cross was a sign of the false messiah it was a sign of the antichrist Jesus when he hung on the cross he destroyed Satan his kingdom and his false church by the finished work he destroyed it all that's why we don't run around with crosses around our neck because it's a symbol of the false messiah it's a symbol of sun worship the Pope is known as the pontiff or the word pontiff means priest of Baal he is known as the pontiff or priest of Baal he is called vice God or God on earth he claims to be God on earth he is called the vicar of Christ and the word vicar means substitute to Christ so he claims to be God on earth and he claims to be a substitute for Jesus that's why they call him the vicar of Christ he is kissed on the feet and that's exactly what they did to all Babylonian kings they kissed Babylonian kings on the feet Jesus said kiss the son lest he be angry with you you got to worship the son if you're not if you don't worship Jesus he said in Psalm 2 he said he will be angry with you and so they bow down and they kiss the feet of this Babylonian king or Babylonian priest called the Pope I want to have a right spirit about this I love these people and you love these people but I'm very strong against this system okay so if you if you sense a very strong deliberate firmness and fieriness about me it's real because it's a false religion that calls itself Christ but just so you'll know where I'm coming from here I don't have a hatred toward the people I do hate the system I said I hate the system but I don't hate the people that are in the system I, the reason why I'm giving this so they'll come out of that false thing okay just so you'll know where I'm coming from here he wears a two-headed mitre like thing that's split down the middle and it is the literally the hat of the fish Dagon so he is a, a priest of Dagon and Dagon is just another name for Nimrod so y'all ever seen the Pope he's got that that hat looks like a fish claims to be a fisher of men no he's a worshiper of Dagon Dagon he's got a, a fisherman's ring on his hand and that ring links him to pagan worship of Dagon or Nimrod all right He carries a crooked rod. That crooked rod is also linked to Nimrod. Hello. The Pope forbids the leaders in his system to preach from or, or to read the word of the Lord in the common language of the people. Why is that? Because he don't want you to get informed. He doesn't want you to understand hello you ever go to a, a, a service where they're reading you can't understand a word uh, uh, man they speaking in tongues or what you know I can't understand a word they're reading a word they're saying nye, 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 nye. you know they're doing all kinds of stuff with their little thing water throwing water at you and, and I'm going what in the world do you say he don't want you to know what he's saying He speaks in Latin. Kind of reminds me when I used to go to the doctor, I'd get a prescription, you know. The only few times I've ever been to a doctor. And he'd write that baby out, and I'd look at it and I'd say, what in the world is that, man? I could never figure out what in the world that was. And I found out he wrote in Latin. Well, that's what the priest did. Well, I'm not saying they all do now, but that's the doctor I had did. number 10 I want to talk to you about non-bloody sacrifice okay when you go and you take a mass you are taking what they call a non-bloody sacrifice they believe that 
that wafer turns into the body and that wine turns into the blood of Jesus but it's a non-bloody sacrifice it's connected to the woman now why is it non-bloody because they want to portray to you just as they always did in the mystery religious cult of Babylon that the mother was more kind than the son that the mother has more cat compassion than the son does so if you want compassion go to the mother and not the son and let the mother intercede to the son for you because she's a lot easier to get along with than the son so in connection with her worship is the non-bloody sacrifice when you take a mass you are participating and you are really you are literally receiving a false god into your mouth and that false god's name is Baal or Nimrod you are participating in the worship of mystery Babylon when you go to mass now notice this I'm gonna just tell you and I'm gonna read some of this out of you. I don't have time to read it all to you but notice that it's a round wafer when Jesus took the bread he broke it he didn't make it round why do they make it round because it symbolizes what they worship and that's the Sun that's why it's round and on that wafer has the letters IHS upon it Isis Horus and Seb those initials are literally placed on that wafer so that when you take that wafer in you are taking Isis Horus and Seb symbolically into you and you are involved in the worship of the Son and that's what they were doing in Jeremiah 44 offering bread to the Queen of Heaven and, and uh, a drink to the Queen of Heaven they were involved in a mass my friend but see now they called it Jesus or they call it the Lord's Supper but it's not the Lord's Supper got the initial of pagan deities upon it now keep in mind Jezebel brought this in uh, she in, into or mixed that system of religion into the church in the Old Testament okay time of the Kings now watch y'all with me still in regard to the pagan characters of the unbloody sacrifice of the mass we have seen not little already but there is something yet to be considered in which the working of the mystery of iniquity will still further appear there are letters on the wafer that are worth reading these letters are IHS what mean these mystical letters to a Christian these letters are represented as signifying Jesus um, homonium salvator Isis homo, homo, homonum homonum Salvatore, or mean Jesus the Savior of men but let a Roman worshiper of Isis for in the age of the emperors there were innumerable worshipers of Isis in Rome cast his eyes upon them and how will he read them he will read them of course according to his own well-known system of idolatry Isis Horus and Seb that is the mother the child and the father of the gods in their words the Egyptian Trinity he goes on and says the Egyptian Trinity are y'all still there so this non-bloody sacrifice offered or the mass that was offered to the Queen of Heaven was called by Babylonian priest she was called the mediatrix mediator between God and man but it has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper the wafer is a symbol of the sun and the letters upon it literally tell you the false deities that you're worshiping okay purgatory and then I'll get in here in Revelation and I'm going to show you how this fits purgatory and prayer for the dead another point it was taught by the Roman Catholics but Plato who was born 427 BC believed in the doctrine of purgatory okay he taught the doctrine of purgatory now in this system they pray for the dead and they preach the doctrine of purgatory that you can literally bring an indulgence and indulgence by money or whatever 
and you can bring that person out of a place called purgatory, a mediator place between heaven and hell, a place of suffering that everybody goes to. Even, even the Pope goes to purgatory when he dies. Mary, Mother, um, Mother Teresa, when she died, went to purgatory in their doctrine. It doesn't matter what she did in this world, okay? She still went to purgatory, and they still had to pray her out of purgatory. They have prayer for the dead to get them out of purgatory, and they offer indulgences, money, etc., to the Roman Catholic Church to get you out of that place of suffering so you can go to heaven. And it doesn't matter what position you are in, you have to be prayed out and be paid for. That's all linked to paganism. It's linked to Baal worship, and Plato was a false person. Plato believed in the doctrine of the Trinity, and he taught, he believed in purgatory. Okay. So those are just a few facts that, that, that prove to you there is a system of religion today that is in churchianity. And throughout these churches, the Lord is warning His church about these false teachings. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, same thing. The doctrine of Balaam, same thing. Okay? That I just read to you about. Uh, Jezebel. Now he's talking about Jezebel. Jezebel is the woman who brought in the mixture of false worship, bell worship, into the worship of God. Brought it in to the church, so to speak. Okay? So when I look at Thyatira, the word Thyatira literally means continual sacrifice. And so that's what they do when they gather in a, in a church. They believe that when they receive that mass, or they participate in that mass, that uh, the sacrifice is taken over and over and over again for them. They're literally taking the body and blood of Jesus. Am I right? Anybody, any Catholics, former Catholics out there? Am I telling the truth tonight? I'm just making this up. It's a continual sacrifice. But remember this, in Acts chapter 16, we had a true church established in Thyatira. A woman by the name of Lydia came into the kingdom of God there in Thyatira. She was a seller of purple. But we see here, this church has been caught up in the paganism or the bell worship that's in that world uh, in that day. Asia Minor is modern day Turkey. That's where these seven churches were located. Now watch this. He said, these things saith the Son of God. Why does Jesus focus on the fact of his deity to this church? Because he wants you to know that he is God come in the flesh. That he is not a part of any trinity of persons or trinity of gods. That all came from paganism. Jesus is the one God of the Bible. He is the Father and the Son at the same time. 100% man and 100% God at the same time. And the Holy Ghost is none other than the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of God that you receive. You don't receive a third person. You get the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of God Himself. He's God come in the flesh. And to be a follower of the doctrine of the Trinity, which means you believe that there are three separate persons, you find its foundation in a false Babylonian system. It is not Bible. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God come in the flesh. And the focus is upon His deity. And this system has infiltrated not just Catholicism, but it has infiltrated Protestantism. So that most Protestants today teach a doctrine called the Trinity or a three-headed God. It's linked to Babylonianism. It's not in the Bible. Jesus is the Father come in flesh. Isaiah 9 in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and thou shalt call his name Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus is not just the Son, Jesus is the Everlasting Father. Jesus is not just the Son, Jesus is the Mighty God. So you're looking at a one God preacher today, and I'm not apologizing for it. I don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. I don't believe in three separate persons. I believe that Jesus is the Son and the Father. He's the mighty God. He's the fullness of the Godhead in body. And so the focus, the emphasis upon to, to this church is His deity. He's the mighty God in Christ. 
And he's not the false Messiah. He's the true Messiah. He's the true Savior of the world. He's the one who brought in the true kingdom of God. And there's a true Christianity that you can be a part of. But you can also be a part of a false Christianity, a false church system, and a false kingdom if you want to be. But I'm here to tell you today, to give you the truth today, to set you free. Because the truth will make you free. The truth will set you free. He said he's got eyes like a flame of fire. When Jesus comes, you know. In these situations like this, he don't come in here like in this situation as a gentle lamb, you know, all passive, laid back. He comes in there with eyes as a flame of fire. He comes in there to look at that sin. He comes in there to uncover the, the false doctrine that's in that church. He comes in, come on, he's looking as a flame of fire today at all of us. He's looking at the church world today. And he sees what's in her and all the corruption and all the paganism and all the false doctrine that is coming to the church of the living God. And that's the way he comes. He don't come messing around. He says, I'm going to... I'm going to put your children to death. He comes in there with a sword. He comes in here to kill that kind of thing. He's not this passive, spineless Jesus that so many want to preach today. He's a mighty God. He's a jealous God. <laughs> jealous God. like consuming fire. And I want you to know it. Jesus came in this... Auditorium today is eyes as a flame of fire. It'd blow your mind. Because you only want to see him as the passive little lamb. Man, he comes to do war. He comes to fight. He comes to kill. He comes to remove some stuff. And so he goes on, he says, he says, but to this church though, he does say, he said, I know your works. And your charity, your love. And your service. Amen. I mean, you're, you're yielding to me. You're trying to serve. You're, you're serving uh, something that's higher than you, you know. Uh, and your faith. You, you don't quit. Now, I wonder. I'm not so sure that he's talking about the false people in the church. He's talking to, to the true people in the church. In case you want me to explain that to you. He's talking to true people in the church. People who are working for him. People who are serving him. People who are faithful. Who haven't quit. They just got a I won't quit spirit about them. Nothing going to take them down. They're going to be dependable. They're people you can depend upon. They're, yeah, they're faithful to God at his house and his church and his work. And so God comes in and he come, he's got flame of fire in his eyes. But he says, you know what? I do recognize your love, your charity, your service, and your, your faithfulness or your faith. You're dependable. You stayed with it. And then he says, not only that, but your perseverance. Your endurance. And the only time you ever have to persevere is when you're suffering for Christ. But if you're suffering for him today, that means you've got to persevere. You've got to endure. You've got to overcome that. You can't succumb to that. You can't wave your little white flag to that. You've got to stand up. You've got to, you've got to persevere to the end. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. This is not a passive Christianity that is preached in this book. Woo! And he says this. He said, in the first, the last to be more than the first. He said, you really, you started out serving me and you were working for me. He said, but now the works are increasing. You're doing more today than you did before. He said, I knew what you did before by way of service to me. But now your service is greater today than it was at the start. But then he says, I've got something against you. Here's the things that you're doing right. Amen. He said, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel. There she is. She's the one that brought the paganism into God's worship and called it God. It used to be on the outside of Israel, but it came into Israel in her day. Now Jezebel has come in there, which calleth herself a prophetess. She's a self-called woman. She's not called by God. She's a self-called woman. She's a Jezebel. Hello, somebody. 
And what is she doing? She calls herself a prophetess. Well, that's linked to Simon Magus. He called himself an apostle. And his, his so-called wife called herself a prophetess. So we're still linked to the same thing here. Self-appointed people. To teach and seduce my servants. Her whole purpose is to conquer God's servants. Her whole purpose is to conquer God's prophets. Her, her whole purpose is to bring in lies and heresies and false doctrine and mingle it among the church of the living God. And the church in Thyatira was allowing this woman. Now her name I don't think at birth was Jezebel. But God called her that because she was doing the same thing that Jezebel did. And she had the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel had long died and was gone, eaten by the dogs by a violent death. She had long gone, but her spirit, the spirit that controlled her, moved into that woman in the church of Thyatira. And that church let her stand up and preach her false doctrine and lies in that congregation. And God stepped in there, Jesus, with a flame of fire in his eyes. And he said, I've got something against you. Because you suffer that woman which calls her Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to seduce my servants. And to commit fornication, spiritual immorality spiritual fornication spiritual unfaithfulness and possibly physical fornication see you can commit fornication against God two ways physical fornication by having a physical immoral sexual act or you can commit fornication spiritually by turning your back on God and becoming unfaithful to Jesus Christ and getting caught up in that false system of religion then you become the same as she was now watch this are y'all awake now so it was creeping into the church of Thyatira and they were letting it in now in case you don't know it we're living in, a, in an age right now where even oneness churches, Jesus name churches, and holiness churches are letting things go. They're letting, they won't stand up and preach the truth, many of them, because they're afraid to do so. And that spirit of Jezebel is dominating some of those men in those pulpits. Now notice. Jezebel was a fornicator. She was a false prophetess. She was a lewd woman who Ahab married. The thing about her is that she was a picture of all people who have a relationship without covenant. A relationship without covenant. I got news for you. If I'm going to be married to Jesus, I'm going to have taken his name. There's a lot of people who are not willing to take his name. They want to say, yeah, I love Jesus and Jesus belongs to me and I belong to him. But they've never been baptized in his name and they have never been filled with the Holy Ghost. Because they don't want to take his name. See, they don't want that commitment, that covenant commitment to the Lord. They want to live the way they want to live, live in sin and fornicate and do whatever they want to do and live unholy. They don't want a relationship that, that binds them to a commitment and to a covenant. It's like nailing jello to a tree, man. Try to get some people to live for God. You, by the way, you can't nail jello to a tree. I mean, they're so wishy washy. watch and not only that in that day but in our day that doctrine has crept into the church and I already proved it, it's in a major system you know praise God but let me talk to you about this end time spirit of Jezebel that you're gonna have to overcome the end time spirit of Jezebel that I'm going to have to overcome. We've already faced her on more than one occasion in this house. But I got good news for you. You know what? God's power will set you free. God's power will deliver you from that spirit. But guess what? We're not going to let her hang out with us. We're not going to let her stay in our house. She's 
She wants to take over. She wants to control. She wants to dominate what's going on in the house. And bring in her lies and all that. So anyway, the Lord says this. Okay. To teach us to do my service, commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto I.